Sometimes when you have a lot of work that needs to get done or some things that you really need to figure out, the best thing that you can possibly do is just forget about it. Relax, take a break, find a distraction project. That's exactly what this was right here. Total distraction project. I definitely didn't need a box this nice for a couple of saw blades, but I wanted it. I had fun making it and I learned some new things, so I consider that a win all around. I didn't do a build video for the whole thing, but I did take enough pictures that I can kind of walk through the steps in case you need a distraction project as well. So let's take a closer look. I have been having a lot of fun with my new Force finger joint blade set and the finger joint jig that I made to go with it. The blade set that I received initially developed a chipped tooth during some of my first cuts. I don't think it came chipped and I don't think that I chipped it, but I contacted Forrest and they were pretty quick to get me a replacement set. It is always nice to see a great product backed by a great warranty. I spent some time right off the bat trying out the new blades, building a finger joint jig and doing some test cuts. And once I felt more confident that I could repeatedly create joints with just the right amount of clearance, I started finger jointing some nicer pieces of wood like this box elder box with box joints. And as long as I was making boxes, I thought it would be appropriate to make a box for the blade set since they don't come with a case for some reason. After making about 10 laps around my workshop, looking at all of my options for scrap wood, I settled on this beautiful piece of reclaimed red oak. Uh, I think it's some kind of reddish oak, uh, but it is just really heavy and really dense but it still cuts just like butter. I mean, just incredibly smooth edges. I didn't have any problems with, uh, with splintering on that despite how dense it was. Really nice piece of wood. I cut the finger joints on the side and uh, test fit everything together. And then I went over to the router table and used a half inch router bit and some stop blocks to cut a stopped dado on the inside of, of each of the sides. It stops just before it gets to the end so that once you glue it together, you don't see the the, uh, the dado is sticking out at the finger joints. And that is to receive this solid ash bottom panel. I was thinking about using a piece of plywood for that, but I'm a little short on plywood right now and I have an abundance of hardwood scraps. So I just glued up some ash to use that instead. And uh, just to avoid any potential problems with wood movement over time, I'm, I'm in a non-climate controlled workshop, so wood will expand and contract in here. I only glued about four inches of the ends right here, and uh, this is just free floating in the sides, and that way uh, the, the end of each of these boards is going to be able to expand and contract, and it's not going to cause any, any problems with, uh, with cracking on that bottom panel. Now before I glued it together, I drilled a hole in the exact center of that panel to receive this 5 8 of an inch wooden dowel which I made on my uh, router table dowel making jig, which I still need to do a video about, and I will once I finish working out some of the details, or maybe I'll just give up and make a video showing what I have right now. It's, uh, it's nothing too crazy, but it works great. And uh, that is just to receive the 5 8 of an inch arbor hole and the saw blade. Well, this was all drying. I started working on putting together something for the top, and uh, for that, I went into some of my, my uh, scrap wood boxes that I keep under my workbench here. And this one is probably my most favorite box. This is where I keep all kinds of, of uh, interesting pieces of wood that are just scraps left over from other projects or little pieces that I'll glue together. Um, anytime I need to add some kind of detail to a piece of wood or build a knob or something, I'll reach into this box and see what I got. And for this one, I found the, some of this laminated hickory that I used for the spacers between the saw blades. And then in one of my other boxes, which I use for making end grain cutting boards, I save up all these square pieces. Uh, I found a couple blocks that I was able to use for, uh, for the top here. I have these ones that are purple heart and beech, and I had a couple pieces of chestnut oak as well. And here is some scrap maple left over for, from some picture frames that I built and some, some other maple left over from something else, who knows. This is also maple in the center, but it's a much older piece and a little bit different color than, than these ones were. And these are two pieces of cherry. And then I, uh, I glued all that together and let it sit for a while. I gave it a couple days because I wanted to make sure that, uh, uh, the, that the moisture level stabilized from the wood glue so that I didn't have any warping after I, I uh, 
flatten the lid and put it in place. And that gave me a little bit of time to work on chiseling out for the, the hinges. Uh, I, I did the mortises first after marking them carefully. Uh, I cut the mortises uh, roughly with a, a handheld router and then I chiseled out the waist to get them perfectly square. And then once the top was dry, I could cut it to the approximate final dimensions. I used a marking gauge to put a perfectly straight line across there and use the drill press to drill the holes so that it wouldn't be uh, go on there crooked. And I left a little bit of overhang on the sides and the front, and that's so that I could flush trim it later. That way, if I want to put this thing on a shelf like that, it's going to stand up straight you know, or display it that way. Uh, or I could lie it down flat. I just wanted the, the sides and the, and the front to be flush with the sides of the box. Once the top was, uh, was attached and on a hinge, I could insert this pin in the, or this uh, quarter of an inch stainless steel bolt into the center of the dowel. I marked the center of the dowel very carefully and used a Forstner bit to drill down there about uh, an inch or so. I cut the head off of the bolt so that it would slide down in there. And uh, on this end, because the just the regular tip of a bolt is kind of rough looking, I polished this. I, I sanded it down and I polished it with a, a buffing wheel to get a nice rounded polished tip on there. And then I put a little mark on there with the, with the wax crayon and closed the lid just bumped it on there to get a little mark where I knew that the, the center of the, the, the bolt was going to hit on the lid. And I drilled a hole so that I can get it perfectly centered on there. And for the wheel that goes on the top, uh, I used a, a small piece of wenge that, uh, man, I don't know how long I've had this thing, but it was kind of a rough looking piece. Uh, most of it was this color, but there were also some much lighter spots on here, some, uh, some soft, slightly rotten areas of sapwood. And to fix that, I just, uh, after I cut it, I, I uh, swept up some of the sawdust, mixed up some five minute epoxy, put a little alcohol in there to thin it down to about 50% 50, uh, 50 alcohol, 50% epoxy, and I mixed in the sawdust from the wenge, and uh, that came out to about this color. And those, those few spots where there were some white streaks that were, were a little bit soft and rotten, I put that epoxy in there. It soaked it right up and was a perfect color match. So you can't really even see those now unless you look closely and see some of the spots where there was some tear out from the router. And on the underside, I uh, used a drill press to put a small hole in there. And then I chiseled it out to perfectly fit a, a quarter of an inch bolt that'll go down on here. And once I knew the thickness of the wheel, I could create an MDF template to, to route out this hole in the center using a, a white side bowl and tray bit. Now, once I had everything fit and put together uh, and the, the spacers cut out, I rounded all of the edges with uh, an eighth of an inch round over just because it is in a workshop and the corners are going to get bumped and I wanted to, uh, to avoid any unnecessary chipping if, if it was at all possible. And uh, once I got everything sanded after that down to 220, I finished it all with three coats of water locks, which is a very rewarding experience after the, uh, the pleasures of sanding a woodworking project. And after applying the water locks, uh, I looked at the top and I noticed that there were a few spots up here where the, uh, the grit from the previous sandpaper uh, level was still showing. I, there were some scratches in here. So uh, I, I thought about just leaving it, but a couple of days later it was still driving me nuts. So I sanded the top down again to get it perfectly smooth and reapplied a couple coats of water locks. After the water locks cured for a couple days, I used a, a white 3M pad and some paste wax to buff it out, remove all those little bumps, and that just resulted in a perfectly silky smooth finish. I and mean, this, this thing is, <laughs> it's slippery. I'm hoping that I don't drop it, because that is just a smooth, silky box there. Oh, baby. Well, this project was a lot of fun, and it is now the nicest saw blade box that I have ever owned. And if you decide to build a nice saw blade box for yourself, or if you've already done so, please put a link to the pictures or a video down in the comments. I'd love to see what you did. Thanks for watching. Have fun.